Thank you, everyone. I think we're all thrilled to have Leila here with us. And uh, I'm just going to dive right into the questions, and then we'll have a little bit of audience Q&A uh, at the end. So Leila, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you. Um, I want to start by talking a, a question about the perfect nanny, um, the fact, and maybe this is true in other writing that you do, of writing in this omniscient voice and embodying men and women and children. And I heard, I've heard you say that you feel like you can embody these characters and that you're identity-less when you write. Uh, I'm curious, uh, particularly from my own feminist background and working with women writers who feel it is so important to identify as a woman when they write, if you ever get pushback and what your feelings are, if you could just let us know about this idea of being identityless and why that matters. You know, as I said before, I don't really care about ethnic identity or uh, about the question of who am I? Because you can ask yourself for many years and many hours, who am I, who am I? I'm not sure you're going to find an answer to this question. But you can ask yourself, what am I doing? Is what I'm doing good? Am I a good person regarding what my acts? And that's what interests me. And that's also what interests me when I'm writing. I'm not trying to write a lot about the psychology of my characters. I want to describe what they do. And I trust the reader because I think that the reader is clever and he's going to interpret the the acts of the of the characters and to know that if he does this he thinks this i think it's very important to focus on the acts of the the characters so that's why i write in this uh, sometimes um, as you said I, I write with a certain distance and i try just to look at the characters and describe it's like if there were uh, i was looking through a, a window and I'm looking at them, and they are, for example, you have the children in a park with the nanny, and I try just to describe. I try to observe a situation and tell you what I see. That's what is important for me. The, the identity or the identification of myself to my characters is not very important. But at the same time, I must say that I have a lot of empathy for my characters. Because, as I said before, they force us into you. They populate you. You live with them. You, I, I lived with Louise and with Miriam and with Paul and with the children for many months. I know them very well. I know what they feel. I know what they think. And of course, you can see it in the, the way I, I write. But at the same time, it's important for me to keep a certain distance. <coughs> it's interesting that you say that you don't write so much with the idea of psychology in mind and that it's more about the doing because I found it to be so psychologically astute. And I, I, what I wondered about you <laughs> as I was reading the dynamics. You wondered if I was crazy or, <laughs> uh. or... Or how you could know people's psychology so much and so many different characters and the character dynamics. And so I, I'm just curious, Mary, are you just an observer of human nature? Do you have a background in psychology? What makes you be able to get into those dynamics in that way? No, I have no background in psychology at all. But I just think that I... I love people and I'm very interested in the human being and I love watching someone and just observing. And uh, I actually, as I said, I like to watch how someone is eating, how he walks, how he talks. And when you look at those details, you can know a lot of things about psychology. Because psychology, you can see it through the, the acts. It's not just something that you, you, you can't read into the, the minds. You just can interpret through the, the acts of, uh, of people. And I must say that I'm, I am moved by the human beings. That's something that I can't explain. But I'm like this since I was a child. My mother was a doctor and she, she was really a humanist, can you say humanist? She, she loves uh, to take care of people and she was very kind. And every day when she came back from work, she was telling us the stories of the, the sick people she was treating. And she was so tender 
when she was uh, saying all those stories that I think that she, I learned uh, looking at her, I learned how to, to love human being and how I, I try also not to judge. I'm not interesting, uh, interested in judging people. I'm interested, interested in understanding people. I'm glad you mentioned about your mom and, and your background because you make such strong statements. I was listening to quite a lot of interviews and I love it. <laughs> I love how forthright you are and eloquent. Got quite a bit of pushback uh, and from people. Even, you know, especially I think the French, French tend to be a little more passionate um, in, in the way that they... Aggressive, you mean. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so I was just wondering w if you could tell us about where that comes from, you know, if you ever experience any kind of uh, doubts in, in convictions. And I, I was curious, I guess, if it's about your family of origin or um, the broader context of your experience growing up in Morocco, being bicultural. I know that you're Muslim. I mean, I'm just, I wonder where this conviction comes from. Uh, you know, my father was a banker, my mother was a doctor, and I was raised in Morocco. And um, I was raised in a home very... F it was uh, far away from the, the city. I was in Rabat, the capital, but the, the home was a little bit isolated. And actually, we were isolated, not only geographically, but uh, also in our way of life. We were not living in the same way of the Moroccan society. Our values, our... The, our way of life, the fact that we were drinking alcohol and that we were very multicultural, we were not religious. So it was very different. And for me as a child, sometimes it was very weird because uh, every child wants to belong. You want to belong to a community. You want to be like everyone else. And I was asking my parents, why are we not like everyone else? Why when people are doing the um, religious uh, uh, feasts and parties and everything, we are not doing it? And we are very weird and I don't want to be weird. And my parents told me, we are not weird, we are free. And I was like, okay, I don't understand. And when I was telling them, what should I do with my life? And you should tell me to which group I belong. They just told me, you just have to invent yourself. We won't tell you what you have to do. We won't tell you what are the rules. We won't tell you what kind of woman you should be. You have to invent yourself. At the same time, it's very difficult because you feel very lonely because you're just alone with yourself and you have to invent your destiny. But in the other way, that's extraordinary because you're the only actress of your destiny and you can do whatever you want. And they always told me, we don't care what religion you are, we don't care what you, who you marry, we don't care where you live, we just want you to do exactly what you want and to have conviction and to be coherent, not to say something in the contrary the next day. And then oh, don't be afraid of being free. Mm. That's quite a gift. Um, I, I want to go back to the perfect nanny for a second because uh, Personally, I had heard whispers of it. <laughs> That's kind of how it seemed to be like, oh, have you heard of this book, The Perfect Nanny? And then someone said to me, well, here's the plot. And I said, wow, I'm not reading that. Um, <laughs> I heard this many times. <laughs> I figured, I figured. That's why I bring it up. Um, and, and yet the readership clearly is people like me. I have a son, I have a nanny, had a nanny, not anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, I heard that too. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I wondered about tackling this topic. You're a mom. I assume you have a nanny now. Uh, and what made you my God, not only want to tackle this topic, uh, and I'm curious about the actual story in New York, because if you read about your book, people say that it's based on that, but I don't even know if it's true. Okay, it's not. So maybe dispel that myth, and also, yeah, what, what possessed you to write about it, and then also to stay with it. I mean, I'm assuming it took a year or more to write, and that must have been difficult at times. You know, for me, this book is not about the murder, actually. The murder is just an sort of a narrative technique to begin with. But the book is not about the murder. The book is about fear. How motherhood is feeling this fear, this primal fear. You can be Chinese, American, Moroccan. You can be from wherever you want. You, c you know this fear. If you are a mother, if you are a father, you know this fear. 
You know, I remember that the first time I looked at my son when he was just born, I think that the first feeling that I felt was fear. It was love, of course, but it was mixed with fear because I looked at him and I was like, oh my God, he's so vul vulnerable, he's so fragile. Anything can happen to him and I'm not sure I will survive if something happened to this human being. And I was overwhelmed by this, this fear. And you know, my mother was very anxious when I was a little girl. She was afraid of everything. I So now I can't drive, I've <laughs> never did bike. I, I can't do nothing because my mother was af always afraid that I was going to hit myself. And, uh, and I was always like, why are you so anxious? I don't understand. When I was a child, I was very furious against her because of this anxiety. And then I became a mother. <laughs> and I was like, okay, now I understand exactly this feeling. But I thought it was very weird because we never speak about this anxiety. It's like a sort of taboo. We never speak of this fear, the fear that something can happen to our children, the, f the fear that maybe they could die. Even if I say this, everyone is like, oh my God, you shouldn't say it because it's too taboo, it's too, too horrible. But I wanted to explore this. I wanted to look at this fear in the face I wanted to, in a certain way, it was a sort of catharsis for me. I needed to write about this because it was so big and I was so anxious. I needed to share it with other women and my readers and tell them, you feel this, you too, you can understand. Please tell me that I'm not alone, that I'm not alone to be so anxious about my children. And so to dispel the myth part then, you didn't base it on the New York incident. No, you know, I'm not interested at all in uh, writing about a true story or investigating details. I was already writing the book and actually I discovered this story and it uh, unlocked my inspiration on how to address the story. So I began to read a lot about uh, those kind of cases, this case in New York, another case in Strasbourg that was uh, actually uh, quite the, the same, the Louise Woodward case also, and that's why I decided to call Louise Louise because of this, uh, of this case. Because for me, it was very important to uh, not be afraid as a writer of the violence that is inside this relationship of a mother and a nanny. This is a very soft relationship, a relationship where there is a lot of tenderness, of love, of care, but also there is the possibility of violence. We all do as if it doesn't exist, but we know that somewhere there is this possibility of violence, and that's why it was important for me to begin with a murder, to say it. To, to begin with this thing that was very strong, so to, to hook the, the, the attention of the reader and to tell him violence is possible, the worst violence is possible. And that worked very well. <laughs> uh, it's a very, very compelling read. Uh, so the speaking of taboo topics, I mean, it seems that you're gravitated toward taboo topics and things that people don't speak of. You're current book, you have a new book, right? Uh, Sex and Lies, and it's about the sexual lives of Moroccan women. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about that, but also understand why these taboo topics, why it feels important to you to be drawn to that. I also think this book in particular has been called a livre shock, like a shocking book in France. And I read an article that said, it has scandalized an entire nation. <laughs> So, more on that. <laughs> you see me, can I scandalize a nation? I'm, I'm a nice person. Um, no, this book, Sex and Lies, it's about, so it's about Morocco. The situation in Morocco is very particular, very ambiguous. Uh, the law in Morocco forbids um, the sexual relationships between persons who are not married. The only sexual relationships that are allowed are relationships between married people, so heterosexual relationships. Abortion is forbidden, homosexuality is forbidden. A woman has to be a virgin before her marriage. But everyone knows that nobody respects those laws because obviously people have a sexual life. So it's very ambiguous because the authorities say, okay, do whatever you want, but don't get caught. 
do whatever you want, but do it in your home behind the curtains. And if nobody sees you, that's okay. So of course, if you're rich, you have a house, you have a car, you can travel. It's very easy to have a sexual life. It's very easy to be a homosexual. It's easier to get an abortion in good condition. But if you're poor, you don't have a house of your own or you share your house with your sister, your uh, brothers, your mother, your father, your mother-in-law. Of course, it's very difficult to have a sexual life, to have intimacy, to have a, a room of your own, as uh, Virginia Woolf said. Uh, it's very difficult, of course, to get an abortion in good condition. In Morocco, there is 600 abortions per day, per day, clandestine abortion, of course, because it's not legal. So for me, this is uh, unbearable, it's shocking, and I'm furious. So I'm fighting for the rights of Moroccan women and men to have a sexual life. To, because I think that having sexual rights, it's uh, uh, a human right. They have to, the right to have a, a sexuality that is uh, secure, that is um, uh, something that will give you joy, and I think that this hypocrisy, the fact that our own authorities tell us to lie, tell us that sexuality is a shame, that we can do it, but that we have to hidden ourselves, I think that it's shameful to say this and that we should give something else to our youngsters. So I'm furious and I'm trying to fight against those, those laws because, of course, if you say that you have to hide all this and if everything is done in, in a certain lie. Of course, it's very violent. Of course, there's a lot of aggressivity. Of course, women are more harassed, more raped. When you're raped and you're not married, you can't go to the police and say, oh, hello, I was raped because I was with a man in a, you know, in a parking or in a, uh, in a forest and the, the, the man is going to say, okay, you're going to prison because now you're not a virgin, you just uh, lost your virginity. So I think it's impossible to, to continue like this. So I'm fighting uh, against this in this book. And when I, um, I went to Morocco to promote my first book, Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre, it's the story of a, a woman who is a, a sex addict. And I went to Morocco and uh, I was sure that everyone was going to be very scandalized, but they were not because the character was French. <laughs> and I said, oh. <laughs> Those depraved French, <laughs> I knew that they were an infomaniac. I was like, yeah, you know. Um, so a woman came after uh, a conference and she said, can I sit next to you? Uh, can I have a drink with you? And I was okay. And she began to tell me her story, the story of her life, her childhood, when she was a teenager. And she told me, you know, when I was young, my mother, she was nice to me and she let me go to my girlfriend's home and she let me do whatever I want, but she always told me, don't forget. And I was like, why did she tell you don't forget? And she said, don't forget to be a virgin. And this woman told me that she never had pleasure with a man. She never was able to feel free of her body because every time she was hearing the voice of her mother telling her, don't forget to be a virgin. And so I decided to uh, do a tour in Morocco and to meet the more women I could meet. And I met a prostitute, a doctor, a teacher, a student, a woman who got an abortion, another woman who got raped, different kind of woman, a lesbian. And I just asked them, can you tell me your story? And what was fascinating is that at the beginning, the woman was very ashamed because in the in Morocco the the concept of shame of what we call shuma is very important. In Morocco, to be well raised, to be polite, is to be ashamed. Someone needs to be ashamed to be a good person. So at the beginning, the woman was very ashamed to tell me the story. And the more they were telling the story, and the more I feel they were gaining their own dignity. And I, that's why I think it's very important to, to break the silence and to tell the woman, you must speak out, you must tell your story, you're not the one to be ashamed. They must be ashamed, the men who raped you, the men who harassed you, the husband who beats you, it's not you who, you who should be ashamed. So it's very important to tell them to speak out. And the book is the, the testimonies of those women. Sounds fantastic. And um, were you always so political or has it been because of writing that has made you more so? No, I was political even when I was four, you know. <laughs> I was the, the lawyer of my sisters and then the lawyer of my <laughs> friends and I was doing uh, uh, 
a riot and everything. Even when I was a, a little girl, I was always like this. And is it easier to be that way in and from France than living in Morocco? No, I think that if um, um, I have the choice, so I had the choice to go to France and I'm very happy in France, so I can't really tell you, but if I hadn't had this chance, in the, if I was still in Morocco, I suppose that uh, it would be the same. Um, I want to go, I'm kind of flopping back and forth here between the book and, and your life. Uh, so back to The Perfect Nanny, because uh, one of the first reviews I heard was here a very popular program called Fresh Air, and I don't know if you heard that review. Uh, Maureen Corrigan, who's quite a famous interviewer, uh, really took issue with your book, and I'm sure many people have. Um, but I thought she got it quite wrong. You know, she said uh, that she thought that the book was very skilled and beautifully written, but that she was really upset with this notion that it would guilt mothers into staying home. Um, having read the book, I couldn't disagree with it more because I think it's so not that, and you actually are quite sympathetic to Miriam. She's not always likable, but she's very relatable, especially in expressing her desire to be away from her children to pursue work. Um, and sometimes missing them, of course, wanting to come home and just, you know, smother them. And I, of course, having been a working mom, very much felt that conflict of wanting to work and that bind that all moms feel. Um, never enough time to work, never enough time for the children. And I thought you really hit the nail on the head. So what do you say to people who think that somehow you're shaming women into some kind of stay at home manifesto? Uh, like how could they get it so wrong? I say to them, read the book again, I don't know. <laughs> you know, when you're a writer, you just write a book and if people understand, they understand. If they don't, they don't. But uh, you know, the book, I don't own my book. Uh, you do, you readers, and uh, I can't do anything if you don't understand what I wanted to say, because actually what I wanted to say doesn't matter what matters, is what you read in the book. Uh, you know, Proust always said that the book uh, belongs to the readers, and I think that's true, so we have to accept the fact that some people don't understand what we want to say. But of course, thinking that um, leaving the the custody of your children to someone else is something bad, is of course a tool to alienate women. And I of course don't think this, I have a nanny and I think that I, I, wanted, I wanted to put light on those nanny because I wanted to say that we women of the Western countries who have an independent life, who work, who go at night to have a drink and who go to the cinema and we can do this because of what? Because we have nannies, because we have women who come at home and who take care of our children. And I wanted in a certain way to pay tribute to those women, to those invisible women, because we always speak about the empowerment of women. We always speak about the fact that women have the right to, to, to work. That's of course extraordinary, very good and absolutely fair. But at the same time, we don't see that it is possible because a lot of what other women are coming from another world from the south, from Ivory Coast, Philippines, Morocco, Ukraine, and those women are coming here to take care of our children and leaving their own children in their countries. And you know, for me, this uh, sort of um, uh, distinction of work, it was like the, the, Russian, the Russian dolls. You have a woman inside a woman, inside a woman, inside a woman, and at the end you have the little doll that you can't see because she's inside and she's very little, and I wanted to speak of it. And you know, one should not read a book and looking for a moral lesson. It's not about it. Uh, a, a book is not a trial. It's not about judging. It's not about saying who is good, who is wrong, and uh, there is no lesson. I'm not telling what to do. I'm just asking questions. I'm just trying to tell a story, a story that could have happened, a story that is sincere. I'm, of course, not saying to women to stay at home. That's, for me, excuse me, but uh, that's completely stupid. Yeah, I, I agree, and that's it, it. Was interesting though because, of course, I heard that review before I read the book, and then I thought. But it was you a know, disservice. I think maybe it's because we feel so guilty us as women. That's why we can read the bo book like this because we have this subconscious idea that maybe we shouldn't let our children to someone else, but. 
that's what I wanted to write about. Why do we feel so guilty? Do you think that a man who is going to read this book is going to ask himself, should I, should I leave my children to someone else? Should I quit my job? No. <laughs> And do you think that someone is going to say, this book is for men to stay at home? No. Right. They say it's for women to stay at home. Right. Women should say guilty. Why? This is very misogynistic. If someone should say, why not the husband? Absolutely. No, it's a very good point. And, um, and even this notion that, you know, why shouldn't the nanny be replacing the father's time and not the mother's time? And it's just implied. Um, so at the Jaipur Literature Festival, I heard the interview that you gave and someone in the audience, I thought, asked a very interesting question about Uh, women's bodies, you know, and sort of talking about this idea that throughout time in literature there's always been a binary and in our culture in general there's the binary of the virgin and the whore and you in response we're talking about this notion that for so long we've only had one point of view, the male's point of view. Uh, and I loved what you said about women writing and that being this form of expression and that expression is freedom. And you spoke about this a little bit when you were speaking about your new book. Um, but I'd love you to expand on that a bit more because I think it's so important and because this is part of the Women's Lit Festival because I run a press for women writers, I know how strongly women feel that telling their story is so much bigger than just telling their story, that it is releasing something big into the world and testimony as you mentioned as well so just your theories on that a little bit just for the anecdote i was <laughs> with uh, shimamanda ngozi adichi and she told me that one day she was at a conference and at the end of the uh, conference a man told her oh, you know you i loved your book so much i was sure it was written by a man <laughs> <laughs> Because it's a book about history and war, and he was sure that, of course, it was written by a man. Uh, you know, I don't think that um, feminine literature exists. I think that there is just two kinds of literature, good literature and bad literature. That's, uh, that's it. But I do think that it's extraordinary and very important for us women to write and to tell, to testify of what it is to be a woman in this world, of what it is to watch this world as a woman, as a mother, uh, with our body, with, our, with what makes us uh, very specific in this, uh, in this world. And um, for many, 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 many years and centuries, women couldn't write and then they couldn't get published. When they wanted to get published, they, have to, they had to change their name and very often to have a masculine name. So it was very difficult for women just to tell what it was. So, you know, each time I go to my desk and I begin to write, I think about all the women from all those centuries, all the, those women who wanted to tell their stories and a father, a husband, someone told them it's not possible. And I think of them and I want to write also for them. And I want to give this testimony because so many women yesterday, but also today, you know, for example, in my country, in Morocco, it's very difficult for a woman to accept the idea of being a writer. I did a conference one day, and at the end of the conference, I was speaking about my book about a sex addict, and uh, so, you know, all the scandal I made, of a uh, scandal of a nation and everything. And this woman, she came to my mother and she asked her, are you angry against your, uh, your child? Are you furious against her? Uh, and she was like, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm proud of her. And she was like, you know, I could never write because I'm too afraid that my parents won't understand and that I will be a pariah, that I will be mar marginalized. It's very, very difficult in many societies, in many countries, for a woman to just tell the truth or her truth and to break the silence and to use words as, a, as tools. It's very difficult. So I feel a kind of a, of a duty to tell them, yes, it's hard. But it's also extraordinary. And I would give this, uh, this freedom and this extraordinary work for nothing in the world. Thank you for that. Um, we'll go back to the perfect nanny for a second because uh, you don't let Miriam's 
point of view show after the deaths of the children. And I kept expecting, I guess, for you to come back to her. I imagine it was an extremely conscious choice. Um, and I guess I'm curious about why you chose not to, but also about endings in general, endings of books. Now you've written three books, and um, how do you think about endings, and, and then specifically, why did you not come back to Miriam at the end? I love endings. <gasps> wow, because you're so terrified at the end, and you're like, wow, that's the <laughs> end of it. Ah. So that's extraordinary. I like endings more than beginnings. Um, for me, it was impossible to say, to, to, to tell what was happening after, because it was uh, a kind of, I don't know how to say in English, of pudeur, uh, kind of respect uh, for my characters. It was not interesting for me to, to go in this kind of pathos and to say how much they suffer, because it's too much. It's, it's a whole book to speak about what... Uh, parents could feel after your their children are killed by someone they were trusted so, so it's a, it's another book it's another topic it's another theme it's not what i was wanted to to explore i wanted to explore how such a thing is possible uh, how someone who lives with another s uh, person c can see nothing and be completely blind to the um, the loneliness and to the craziness of someone she's seeing every day. S so that's what was interesting to me, but the rest was not the, the theme of my book. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's see, I'm wondering how we're doing on time. I have more questions, but I also thought we might open up to the audience. Okay, gra great. Uh, there's a mic that we would like you to come speak in, right? <laughs> correct? <laughs> Uh, oh, on both sides. Perfect. Okay. So you don't have to cross the stage. Um, yeah, please come down. I see a few people coming. That's wonderful. The mics are... Um, you'll have to go get in line. Sorry. <laughs> we are going to make you get up. Oh, yeah, you can turn around. Yeah. Oh, are you just setting it up? Oh, <laughs> what's your question? <laughs> Hello. Hello. So, uh, first, I'm French, and what a pleasure to have a French author like you here. It's great. Uh, I want to know more about your relationship with your characters, um, mostly for the perfect nanny, because uh, it's really intense. Uh, can you sleep well? Uh, do you think about them all the time? Do you have um, moments in the day or are you absolutely off? What is your relationship with them? Unfortunately, you are never off when you write a novel. So people are speaking with you, you're uh, you know, washing your children in the, in the bath and you're always thinking about what is Louise doing now? Oh, of course she's doing this. So you're never... You're never here. You're always somewhere, somewhere else. At this, but uh, I must say that's something extraordinary at the same time because you have your own world. You have your secret garden, and you're building something. It's like when you're a little child and you have your uh, uh, the, your uh, house of dolls and you're doing your story with your characters. So that's quite uh, extraordinary. I don't sleep well, but I never sleep well. So for <laughs> So that's not uh, that's not particular to to the novels, but uh, you know it, what was very difficult with the perfect nanny. Actually, it was not Miriam or Louise; it was the children. Yeah. What was very difficult was to try to build characters of the children and not being in a caricature or in a cliche, because I hate those novels or those movies where you have children who are so innocent and so nice and so sweet because I don't think that children are innocent and nice and sweet. <laughs> I, I think that children are very complex and children can be very mean but at the same time very gentle that children understand everything even if they don't have the words to express but they understand everything. They understand the relationship between the adults. They know how to manipulate the adults, how to use the love of one to manipulate the other. And I wanted to, to say this, and I wanted to describe this, because I'm fascinated by children 
I love children, but I know them, and I know that they are not innocent and sweet and all of those craps. So what was difficult was to build the, the characters of the children. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I want to first say that it's such a pleasure to uh, hear you speak tonight. And I've just returned from Morocco mm -hmm. in uh, November. We did quite a bit of traveling, and it was my favorite country. Uh, but I had a question, and I'm so pleased to be able to ask you tonight, because the men were very easy to speak to and accessible, but I, I could not find a woman to talk to. And I'm wondering, do you address this in your new book? Uh, and why is that, that the women are so distant? You know, it's because, uh, sorry, thank you for your question. And Morocco is one of my p uh, favorite places also, <laughs> I must say. Um, you know, we don't have, as in the Western countries, a culture of mixity. Um, in Morocco, the public space is a masculine space. When a woman goes into a public space, uh, people consider that, okay, we accept you, but this is not your place. It, you, you don't own the place. You just have to be very discreet. You have to respect in a certain way the male rules. And I try to fight uh, against this culture because it's very important that the authorities and also the culture try to defend the mixity and the fact that we own the, the streets, we own al also the public transportation and everything. It's very difficult to be a woman outside in Morocco because when you walk, everyone can... Uh, Make um, can say things about how you you what you are wearing and how is your breast and your ass and your thing and it's very normal and if you try to answer the man is going to say okay but stay home if you don't want someone to say how you what what are your clothes and how is your your body so we need to address men and to tell them streets is ours too it's not just yours and that's why I think women are distanced because they have the feeling that there are in a certain way there are strangers in the public spaces mm -hmm. yeah. well thank you very much and um, but you know I did not f hear comments about myself maybe the men didn't perhaps I don't know why but it was just I felt there was an impasse between me and the women which I was I was sorry about but didn't know how to bridge. So I thank understand. You. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Hmm. Well, continuing on the gender kind of differences, um, I'm writing a story right now where a man is actually responsible, or he thinks he is, for the death of a child, of his child. And the men who are my readers of the work in progress, they are they they can hardly go on with the story. They, they tell me, they just push back and they don't want to hear it, and um, much more so than the women who have um, uh, more, it seems to be, and I may be reading into this, but more of a, um, you know, a kindred spirit with the emotions that you can have raising children. Like you said, so they're not always all that great, you know. Sometimes they drive you crazy, and uh, and and so the men who react to the reading, the writing that I'm doing right now, um, where where there's a male respondent uh, responsible for what's happening, they can't. They they tell me they can't even continue reading. They can't go on, and I just wonder, you know, what your experience has been with as you were writing or as you've had these talks with other people, the gender difference between accepting the death of a child. Yes, but for me, I think that uh, w women were more afraid of reading my book because um, I think that in the relationship with the nanny, women are more involved. Men, they say, okay, you want to hire this nanny? You decide, honey, that's your choice. Okay, we hire her. But the man, he only comes when uh, it's the time to fire her. A lot of friends, of uh, women friends, told me, oh, okay, now I need to fire her, so that's my husband who is going to do this because I can't. But for the rest, it's the woman who is dealing with the nanny. So I think that uh, it was more difficult f uh, for my book. It was more difficult for women to accept 
the idea that they can go wrong and not see that the nanny is going crazy and can be dangerous for the for the children. But um, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of the fact that people are telling you, "Oh, I don't want to read this." Or uh, actually, that's a good point. That's I think that's good. And uh, I n when I write, no one is reading what I write. I write the whole book and then I give it to my editor and I say, okay, we publish it and we'll see. Because I don't want to be influenced by, twa by what people are thinking. And actually, you know uh, the fairy tales. Fairy tales are always very frightening. When you tell a fairy tale to a child, you're like the princess and the prince, but when you come to the wolf, and to the ogre and to the things that are very frightening, the children are like, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> and then you finish the story and uh, I'm too afraid, I don't want to sleep because of the wolf. And you're like, you wanted me to tell you about the wolf. <laughs> so I think that the adults are exactly the same. We are afraid about the wolf, but the only thing that we want is the wolf. So keep <laughs> writing about the wolf and the ogre and all the things that are frightening because that's what people want. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming today, and it's such an honor to meet you. Um, I'm an exchange student from Morocco. I'm Moroccan, and I live with a ho an American host family here. I'm going to spend the entire um, school year here. And throughout my experience this year, I could um, notice the difference between women, like how women live here in the U.S. and how women live in Morocco, and I'm aware of the problems that um, um, women in Morocco face every day. Um, so my question is, as I'm a female Moroccan and I'm gonna go back to my country and I really wanna like make a change and help improve lives of m women in my country. So uh, my question is how can I do that? And especially cause there's a lot of like um, things that I have to face in order to um, speak up and improve um, life of female in Morocco, so how can I do that? You know, I, I hate the idea of acting like a guru and telling you what to do uh, because I, I can't and I'm sure that you will know what to do. The only advice I can give you is that you will come back and at the beginning you will want to fight and it will be very difficult and you will have the feeling that it's easier sometimes not to say to or to shut up and not to tell exactly what you think. And everyone is going to tell you, oh, that's okay, you know, you have a good life, you live your life, and don't make all this mess, please be calm. And I'm just telling you, don't listen to them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, if anyone else with a question, I'll jump in. Um, these other books, I want to read them. Um, and I don't think they're yet translated. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about when they're in, coming uh, Dans out. Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre is translated and it's going to be out next year. Ah, in the Garden of the Ogres. Yes. Right? Translation, yes. 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 And the other one on Moroccan women? Sex and Lies, I don't know, maybe okay. the, the year after. Okay, fantastic. We really will be looking Thank for these. You. And can you tell us what the reception of your books have been in the different countries? Because I know you've had it translated into a lot of different languages, and you've been touring in a lot of places. Yes, it has been translated in 43 languages. So uh, I've been to many countries. Uh, I just went to China. It was very, it was fascinating to, you know, I think that when I was a little girl in Rabat, which is was a very boring city with no cinemas, no libraries, nothing. If someone had told me one day you're going to go to Berkeley and to China and you're going to speak in English or in not in Chinese because I don't speak Chinese, but in English and you're going to speak about books you wrote, I, w I would have been like, uh -huh, okay, <laughs> you're kidding me. So it's fascinating. Um, what I can say is that even if there are very different reactions in the countries, what strikes me is the fact that this subject is very universal. Because in China, in Korea, in Bulgaria, in Turkey or in Morocco, a mother is a mother. 
and you know what it is to love your children, to feel fear for your children. Um, nannies are everywhere in the whole world for poor people, for rich people, you know, women who are going to the factory to work, they have to let their children to someone, so they have a woman who is taking care of the children. Uh, it's the same for the big bourgeois or very rich women. So uh, what I found is that this topic is very universal and that's very moving to see that uh, you can go to uh, 30,000 kilometers far from your, your home and you're speaking the, the same thing. And what I will add is, you know, I go to China, which is a dictature, because it is. I go to Korea, I go to a lot of countries, and I always say the same, the same thing. I'm always a feminist, I always uh, fight for freedom of speech, and I don't care what is the context or whatever. I think that's what is the most important, is to always be coherent and to fight for my conviction. So that's the most important thing for me. Thank you so much. Um, I've noticed that when someone writes a book, and maybe especially when women write books, there seems to be a, a strong desire uh, to locate um, how the narrative connects to their personal life, their autobiography. And I'm wondering um, how you handle that and, and sort of what lines you draw around uh, how much of your personal life you talk about. Um, you've talked a little bit about your anxiety as a mother and having a nanny, um, but especially especially when you feel that there's a desire to um, sort of solve the mystery of your inspiration um, by connecting it to your autobiography, how you handle that? You know, I handled, handled that with a lot of irony and humor because, uh, as you can imagine, my first novel is about a journalist who is a sex addict, and I used to be a journalist. Uh, she is half Moroccan, I'm half Moroccan, so everyone thinks I'm a sex addict. So uh, I have to to be <laughs> to ha to keep some distance, and you know, it's a sort it's a little bit misogynistic, and it's a, a fantasy that everyone has about writers. Of course, if she writes this, it's because she is this. She is this uh, sex addict, and it's also a way to say that women, they don't really have imagination. They just can tell about their own life. They can't go very uh, far away. Men, they can imagine, oh, they can imagine histories and think extraordinary, but women, they just can tell about their own life. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, if you want, I'm a sex addict, uh, fine for you. No, I think that we have a lot and a lot of imagination, you know. I like to tell stories uh, every day to my children and to people. I like to tell stories and I really don't care. Uh, I think it's funny when people think that it's my real life. And you know, one day, i just tell you this, um, I was in a classroom presenting my book and a young student asked me, um, Ma'am, I wanted to know, do you have children? Are they still alive? <laughs> I believe that, yeah. Uh, this might be a weird follow-up question after that, but I actually do want to ask about your, your process of writing this book because juggling the demands of writing and also having children, and I, I also have two young children and I also write, and I had a really hard time justifying going to the page to write when this book is not demanded particularly by anyone. I mean, how did you do this? You know, it's very difficult. If you say, uh, you know, I need to hire a nanny because I want to write, people are looking at you, okay, you can write, but you can take care of your children, and then when they are asleep, you write. Uh, um, I don't understand, you're not hiring a nanny for this. But if you say, I'm going to the bank or to the factory or I'm going to whatever, okay, that's all right to hire a nanny. But don't listen to this. You know, my, I, s I told my son, okay, if you come in my office when I'm writing, I'm killing you. <laughs> Do you understand this? This is my place. And I tell you, it's my place. You don't come. You don't knock. You don't ask me. I'm here for no one. And at the beginning, he was a little bit frightened, but now he understands. And 
when people come to the house, he says, don't go to mom's office. <laughs> don't go, she's writing. And now he has respect for what I do. And I try to explain to him that, first of all, he needs to respect what his mother is doing. That is very important for me. Uh, and you know, I think it's very... You know, sometimes when I travel, I travel a lot for my work. And I leave my children a lot. And I miss them a lot. And sometimes it's very difficult for me. And sometimes I say to myself, okay, I'm going to cancel the next trip. And I'm going to stay home with my children because they need me. But I don't do it. I don't do it not only because I think it's unprofessional, but I think it's not good for my children. Because I don't want one day to look at them and to tell them, you know, um, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it because I w was feeling too guilty. No, I want to tell them, yes, it's hard, but it's my job, and it's an extraordinary job, and I want you to understand, and I know that you can understand. So you have to make your place, because no one is going to do it for you. And women before us, they didn't have the chance to do it. So you have to fight for it, because no one is going to do it for you. And you have the right to do it. You don't have to feel guilty. You have the right to write. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just wondering what uh, other authors you like or have really influenced you. And also I was wondering if you write longhand or on the computer. I write on a computer, but I didn't bring my adaptator to United States. So today I wrote like four pages on the on the paper and it was wow it was very very nice so maybe <laughs> i'm going to thanks to the united states and to the plugs i'm going to write now on, on a notebook maybe um the authors uh you know i love russian authors a lot chekhov is my favorite author and i read it uh, every time, always, always. I always have a Chekhov book uh, in my in my purse. I love Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Gogol. They are really good observer of the human nature. They are at the same time desperate and very funny. So I love them. Um, I love many authors. It's difficult for me to tell you about all of them, but I would say I love Maupassant. I love Marguerite Duras. I love Russell Banks. I love Philip uh, Philip Roth is one of my favorite authors. Um, I love uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and uh, Vargas Llosa. I love also Stefan Zweig that I read a lot when I was younger. So, so many authors. I couldn't tell you about all of them, but uh, I love reading. <laughs> good, good sign of a, yeah, strong, strong writers should be good readers. Uh, I think we're, it's perfect timing, right? Okay, I'm checking with the, the sound people and the video people. So I want to thank everyone and especially Layla. Thank you, thank thank you, you for so being much. with us. Thank you.